And fortunately, my dad knew what a database was. He said, oh, well, what you need is called a database, not a spreadsheet. And let me set up Microsoft Access. And you can, you know, I'll show you a few things, but you can read the tutorial. That is Katie Coates, a data developer and the author of the katiecoats.com blog. I'm Josh Burke, your host of the Salesforce Developer Podcast. And here on the podcast, you'll hear stories and insights from developers for developers. Today, we sit down and talk with Katie about APIs, integrations, and dealing with data. And in that clip, you are hearing her first introduction into the world of database design after an exercise given to her from her dad. But she didn't really stick with it, and she actually started studying something else in college. French. Yes. So I did that. I got out of college. I realized I did not want to be a professional interpreter or translator. Mm. And I thought, well, what else do I know how to do? And I can type very, very quickly, over 100 words a minute. Mm. And I knew some things about databases, mm. or at least I could tell a temp agency that, yes, of course, I know Microsoft Access, <laughs> run to the library, grab a book called Easy Microsoft Access, and mm -hmm. by the first day, know more than my boss. So, oh, wow. yeah, that was my entrance into the world of technology was just being able to type fast and getting a data entry secretarial job. I mean, I, I have to give you props. Over 100 words a minute is actually really quite fast, right? Yeah, yeah. I had a really great <laughs> typing teacher in <laughs> in school. Okay, so then describe the slippery slope to me. How would you go from a data entry job where you know more than your boss to working with Salesforce? Well, I would say that, okay, so once I made my way into data entry in the nonprofit world, it's the great thing about the nonprofit world is that it's highly collaborative and sh super short staffed. Mm -hmm. And so if you ask the same person to do something for you but somewhere between 10 and 20 times in a row, they'll teach you how to do it right. and just give you the keys and say, please don't break anything. Right. So that was how I was taught what a cross join is and not to do it when you're writing a SQL query. Ah, uh, okay. And I would actually say that my first ETL job was world, word mail merge from, you know, taking a bunch of spreadsheets and trying to get them to do very fancy oh, things. Oh, wow. Yeah I, yeah, I put I put mailing labels on envelopes. Oh, that's a trial by fire right there. Yeah. So <laughs> so really when a Salesforce admin job opened up, I sort of said, hey, it can't be that much different than any other database. And the other people who didn't really know Salesforce said, if you say so, sounds reasonable to us. <laughs> no, it wasn't quite that simple, but mm -hmm. I, I had a couple of skills that they were looking for. And so I was able to get a Salesforce admin job. Mm -hmm. And about half a year into that, I was starting to formally study computer science and PLSQL and TSQL for Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server databases. Mm -hmm. And as we were waiting to get triggers developed by outside consultants, and you have to go through business analysis and planning, <sighs> all of which are great ideas, but also slow you down when you already know the requirements internally, I just thought I should learn right. to do this. Right. So that was how I got into Apex. I've a little bit stayed away from the JavaScript visual side mm -hmm. and really have a love for all things data integration. Mm -hmm. business process automation, all that making data move from point A to point B kind of programming. I, I just love the overall theme here of your interest stays very focused as long as it's going to like help you do less work through the day. Yes. I, I have never actually automated <laughs> myself out of a job, even though I keep trying. <laughs> Nice. Larry Wall would, would very much approve. Um, and that's really, I want to talk a lot today about like, you know, that weird, fuzzy domain, which is like part admin, part developer, and, you know, how these programmatic skills can kind of dip in and help. But so walk me really quickly through, through a term that I am right now trying to remember the first time I heard it. But how would you define an admin developer? An admin developer. Oh, I love also, that one. am I saying that correctly? I think so. I think Forcelandia, did they coin it? That the might Forcelandia be Forcelandia right. conference? Mm, yeah, honestly, I, I got a chance to go to Forcelandia a year and a half ago, and it was that was the term that made me want to go to the conference that used mm. the term. I was just like, this is the best ever. Mm -hmm. But to me, I think an admin developer, I mean, it could be someone who thinks of themselves as a developer, but they're stuck being a solo admin mm -hmm. because they are the Salesforce team. But I think it's more common that it is someone who comes from the admin world and 
needs to be nimble and Mm. just has a job to get done. And as you said, is trying to automate away the boring stuff. Mm -hmm. And so they end up picking up development skills here and there, not necessarily to any degree that they're looking to do that full time, but just Mm -hmm. enough to make sure that their job is always full of only the most interesting stuff. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds like a good domain to have. And I just right now remembering conversations I've had with with people in the past when I would go to like developer groups and I would spend 10 minutes working with somebody, uh, you know, talking about like a visual force problem. And then like I'd ask them about their day job and they're like, well, I'm not a developer. And I'm like, you just spent 10 minutes, to, you know, putting together a visual force page. You are, in fact, doing some developer type things, whether whether you, you know, identify with that as, or not. So I kind of I appreciate a term that allows somebody to kind of hold on to that admin identity, but also basically kind of confess that they're they're getting some programmatic skills under their belt. Yeah. So. This keeps changing, I feel like, right? We've got flow, we've got external services, we have tools that allow admins to do more and more without any programming. Can you tell me some specific advantages that an admin can get if they just tip their toe in a little bit into the Apex world? Sure. I think for me, one of the number one things that you can potentially get is avoiding CPU limits and other kinds mm. and Query limits. So I haven't had the chance to play with Flow as much as I would like because mm-hmm. I came in, to, I actually ended up learning Apex before Flow. Uh, yep. Yep. And so I had incurred a lot of technical debt. Most of my code base was in Apex, so I just needed to sort of keep going that way. Mm-hmm. So I know Flow has an impressive amount of bulkification according to everything I hear, but there are certain things where you might just, if if you... If you're in a trigger context and so things, you know, things need to happen in real time and you really can't afford for triggers to time out. Mm -hmm. If you're not getting what you want out of flow, you might want to try the same thing in Apex. And it's been talked about on the pod before, like, and I guess I'm I'm trying to think of because we're, we're sort of inviting an admin who might be used to flow to take a look at Apex, which is a strongly typed programmatic language. From what you've seen from, so, so you kind of went the other way around. You you started with Apex, and now you're starting to look at Flow. Yes. What what kind of overlap, when you, when you are poking around with Flow, what kind of overlap from like a functional point of view do you see between Apex and Flow? Loops, conditional branching, if statements, mm-hmm. variables, parameters. The mm-hmm. idea that you, that you design a thing that is self-contained, especially with the world of subflows. I'm a really, really big fan of subflows uh-huh. because that's sort of how you put everything into little boxes when you code with just text on a page. Right. Um, that's Otherwise, it would be overwhelming. And again, you know, a, hu- a whole bunch of flow boxes can be overwhelming. So the idea of subflows and that there being certain data you pass from one flow to another, mm-hmm. all of that is so, so similar. Because you're Uh, basically describing a function there. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. I watched a couple of years ago a a Harvard Computer Science 50 course that started out showing people how to code in MIT's Scratch, which is like Mm -hmm. Flow. It's a Mm drag-and-drop visual Mm -hmm. language that was at first invented to teach children how to program, I believe. Yep. And they're teaching college students on their first day in that. And, and, I find Scratch and Flow very much alike. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's very much the same concepts. It's just a matter of whether you drag a box onto the page that says if or you type the word if. Right. Right. Yeah. I've seen Scratch used in IoT projects. I've seen Scratch used to uh, teach kids how to build cardboard robots, which is still one of my favorite IoT moments of my entire life. And I did actually have this moment. And this was when this was when we had process builder, we had flow and everything was still kind of nascent. But it was I was kind of like, you know, what would Scratch for Apex kind of look like? And I think you just answered it. It's basically where flow is right now. Yeah. So I guess. I, I hope people are hearing this and thinking, okay, if I am doing things, even where, though there's this wrapper on top of it, but you are still we're dealing with parameters, you are still dealing with functions, you are still dealing with variables, you're just not kind of calling that in, in flow. So maybe Apex isn't going to be quite as scary as as you thought. And another point that you've made before, and credit to, to Bonnie Hinners on this, like how can Apex be used to help test flow? Yes, I think 
the nice thing about Apex that I can't wait for there to be basically a flow equivalent. But right mm-hmm. now, when you write Apex code that creates records and destroys records and checks their values, and you put seven little characters at the top, at sign is test. It does magic. <laughs> None yep. of those inserts actually happen in the real world. Right. None of that data stays afterwards in the real world. You basically just get a blank Salesforce org that is shaped like your org mm-hmm. to start from scratch in. And so you can hit run as many times as you want on a quality check. And it always behaves the same way. It's never going to pollute your org. And so... Over on Plural Site, Bonnie has created a really great. I think it was a play-by-play with okay. Don Robbins. Uh, um, seems it like it a, always is. So probably. Yeah, and and <laughs> and play, Plural Site does free weekends if you can't afford Plural Site. So keep your eye on their Twitter, David Liu's Twitter. They, it's it's often widely publicized when they have a free weekend, and and gotcha. definitely watch that episode if you're an admin who wants to dip your toe into the water of Apex. I think doing Apex to test the quality of your record triggered flows is probably a really great place to start. That makes a lot of sense because unit tests, I do feel like, have that like they're 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 interesting to write sometimes, but you're always trying to do the same thing. You're creating records, you're testing records, you're you're deleting records, kind of thing. And I. I can't tell how many times I've talked to, to developers and we just sort of start geeking out about like the importance of testing. So like how, you know, not only should somebody learn Apex to do this kind of stuff, but like what's the value of adding unit tests to, to the flows themselves? Ultimately, it's to dummy check that you did it right. There's this mm-hmm. philosophy called test-driven development mm-hmm. where if you're trying to create a flow that takes two in, two numerical inputs and outputs their sum, then you're going to want to put it through the ringer and see what happens when your two inputs are one and one and verify Mm -hmm. that the answer is two. You're going to want to do three and negative three and verify that the answer is zero. Mm -hmm. And you can just do this by hand with, with flow, but if you do it in the unit test context that's built into Salesforce, First of all, not only can you just have a test suite that you can run every time you change your flow right? just to make sure you didn't break one plus one equaling two, but you can actually, this testers and development concept is that first you think about the fact that you're going to be writing a thing that does addition Mm -hmm. and you have a flow that just doesn't even really work yet and you write the test first Mm -hmm. and you say pass one, pass one, expect two, and then you go write the flow. and. So there are some ways that you can think about programming that, to me, I've found Salesforce makes very easy to do and often increase the quality of my work. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's nothing more frustrating than building a huge loop or decision process, and you just realize you did it wrong all the way at the end. Yes. And you don't even know why. So it can be really great to have these tests that you run bigger and bigger tests as you work. Yeah. Which yeah. is another great reason to use subflows and yeah. small pieces. Oh, yes, because you take taking the small parts of the car as opposed to trying to fix the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got introduced to test driven development when I started doing bigger enterprise contracts and it was just like it was it was kind of like I became a huge advocate of it and it's just it's kind of nice to have that checklist of things that you know your code wants to do and everything starts red and then you just start building the car and eventually they all turn turn green kind of thing it's a, it's a nice it's, a, it's I also just feel like it's a nice you know getting things done kind of feel to it too yeah here's an example actually we took a massive sales rep to territory owner ID assignment process and moved it from process builder, in this case to Apex. Um, probably if I were starting now, I might be interested in doing it with flow. But mm. at the time, we didn't have the record triggered flows that we needed and it needed to be highly bulkified. So it was in Apex. But the first thing I did was I wrote a unit test in Apex that said all of the su- it had all of the one plus one equals two, three plus negative three equals zero mm-hmm. extreme cases in it. And I made sure that it ran with the process builder in place. Yeah. Nice. Then I built it with the Apex. I turned uh, off the process builder and I made sure that it still ran. Uh, and nice. then I turned off both of them and made sure that it didn't run. Yeah. 
And every time I've had to majorly change this because they change how sales reps are assigned to territories, all I've had to do is just rerun it and make mm -hmm. sure it still works. And nice. it's it's been a lifesaver and probably saved me weeks of rework, just having something in place that I know I can trust to verify that one plus one still equals two. Yeah. Yeah. And I've had, and you know, it's, I can, I can remember almost everything about this night, except for what the actual bug was. And we were about to launch a big project for Salesforce. And we ran, we did that, like, we're doing all the last minute unit tests before we actually go live. And one of them flags red. And it like, it took me, I think four or five hours to fix the bug and one of those you know late into the evening styled the developer stories but it was five hours of work and not a bug that went out into the wild it would have affected thousands and thousands of people and it's like it, it's like when people don't like unit tests are just so important i'll just i'll just leave it at that so it just so really feels dead, good to know that you found the error instead of somebody instead exactly, of your boss. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, if we can invite some admins into the wonderful world of unit testing, I feel we're we're doing good work there. Okay, so so I'm, I want to start breaking down some of the big pillars of integration and kind of walking through how you work with them, and we'll start with the big one. And I'm going to try to be careful here because I feel like talking to you that this could be you know, like another 40 minute interview all on its own. Okay. Okay. So, but you really can't integrate anything without data, right? Like data is the point of what you're trying to get to. You have your early experiences with data model. You do a lot of data modeling, like, and maybe this is too generic of a question, but like, how would you describe your approach to data modeling? Like when you, when you, when you have a new project and you have to start creating your new custom objects and your standard objects in Salesforce, or you're rolling up a new Oracle in it database. Well, I really like, I'm a big fan of drive alongs. If I get the chance, I like to see someone share their screen with me and say, well, what do you, when you're doing this thing, because there's always a person who wants mm -hmm. their job made easier, almost mm -hmm. always with a data mm -hmm. integration. Mm -hmm. um, and so I say, well, show me your old phone. I'm happy to build you a new phone, but sh show me around your old phone. Uh, okay. And oftentimes I'll, I'll then ask them now, does this go anywhere else? And they'll show me the other portal. And then I'll say, now, who maintains the connection between those two right now? Mm. And then I'll ask the sysadmin who maintains the existing connection in between maybe two systems. To, I'll say, okay, pop the hood and show me the old phone. And so the first thing I like to do is just get a tour of what people already do and mm -hmm. then what people are hoping to do. I really like to whiteboard. I really, um, mm. in a, especially in a business to customer organization, I usually draw a stick figure in the middle <laughs> nice. and write person slash contact under it. And then I start uh -huh. drawing bubbles that are as sort of non-technical, accessible entity relationship diagram okay. going off um, uh -huh. into the extra space on the whiteboard or mm -hmm. the screen. And so I start talking about like, okay, can can this person, it's it's a lot of one-to-one, -one, many to one, many to many kind of data model questioning. What what should happen here? What if someone tried to do this twice? Would you have two records or would you mm -hmm. replace the first record? Mm -hmm. And so that's that's a lot of what I do is it's it's very much a matter of asking people leading questions that come from my education as a data modeler. Mm hmm. I mean, it's very interesting because that sounds like it's a very like task centric approach that you you're you're trying to figure out the the things that the human is trying to get done and then reimagining it on a data level in reverse. Is that is that a, paraf a sound paraphrase? You know, one of the things that I probably almost sound like a robot myself saying is I always <laughs> tell people I'm sure we can automate that, but what I'd love for you to do before, you know, they say, can this be automated? And I say, probably, but what I really think would be a good idea is if you could do it for mm -hmm. about four weeks by yourself, hmm. and then let's schedule a meeting for four weeks from now and tell me all the things that made you feel like a robot. And then we'll put on a different list, all the things that made you mostly feel like a robot, but every once in a while you needed some human judgment. Gotcha. And then we'll put on another list all the things that you definitely need human judgment for. And we'll tackle the ones that made you feel 100% robotic first. Uh -huh. We'll do a maybe for the things that made you feel like they need a little bit of judgment. And we'll say, well, never mind. We don't actually want to automate for the things that you feel 
need human judgment. And so I do definitely see automation and integration as a way of saving humans time. So so keep the human in charge at first, but then divide and conquer what can safely be handed over to the machine. Yeah. Nice. Nice. See, that's okay. So that's that's really interesting. And, you know, clearly your 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 deep background in databases. And I'm gonna confess, before I came to Salesforce, before I was a, I was a Salesforce developer, I was a web developer, I was mostly front end developer, kind of a I, I, I sometimes describe myself as an integration developer, but that was actually like the middle glue layer between the server and the client, not necessarily talking to other services, but sometimes so. But I was a terrible DBA. I, I once killed an entire database with like a select star simply because like I hadn't put closed dates on it or something, you know, some basic things that I would debate. I, w- I would go into more stories, but I, I fear that you'd never talk to me again. But when I came to start working on Salesforce, it's like it made it so easy to at least be like a good DBA because they gave you the fields that every you know object should have. You only were sp- supposed to extend an existing database model and things like that. Coming from the reverse, like having a real background in, in databases, is that helpful to starting development on, on Salesforce, and do you feel like that there's pitfalls that people like myself fall into because they don't have your background? Well, it's hard to say because I sort of went Oracle to Salesforce and back to Oracle. Mm, I, gotcha. I very much miss the unit testing environment when I'm having to code in PLSQL. <laughs> I have to set up and tear down my own data. It's terrible. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I certainly enjoy, I think, you know, if you were going the... Uh, if you're going from Salesforce to a traditional database, I think the number one thing you would underestimate is the power of the SQL language itself. Mm. You can, most of the things you would have to do the long way in Apex, you can do the short way in SQL. Gotcha. It's much richer than SQL. Mm-hmm. And I've actually read PLSQL books, PLSQL being pretty much equivalent to Apex and SQL being equivalent to SQL, that caution not to try to get too fancy with your manual iterative programming and to let the SQL engine do the work because that's always going to be more efficient Mm. whenever possible. And so there are nuances like that, but I think that in reverse, I actually used to run a blog called Oracle to Salesforce as my Mm. very first blog because I was trying to get my head around the transition. It wasn't until I went to a meetup that I realized that you often to do a join, you sort of have to do what I later learned in school is really a manual join where you're just looping over data, mm-hmm. checking equality, or you're using maps to do the same kind of thing, and that you're constantly storing things into temporary memory in a way that you might not in a more mm-hmm. traditional database. And so I actually think it was a little harder to go from the traditional land to the Salesforce land. Mm, because you felt like you had one, one arm tied behind your back. Yes, but on the other hand, again, unit testing. Unit again, testing is great. <laughs> unit, testing, unit, unit testing is good. Yeah, and I, I will admit, I can't. A, a lot of my Apex work is basically starting with a bunch of maps, doing a whole bunch of stuff, and ending up with with a different set of maps. It's it's an extremely common task for for an Apex developer. Yes. Okay, so taking it one level up. We have a data model. If we're having databases talk to each other, APIs are the way that, that these systems can can integrate with data. And schemas are one way to tell what an API does. What's the importance of schemas and what's involved in creating them? Okay. So I think what I actually want to rewind, and I know we're on a developer's podcast, but in case we have any admins listening, an API, it stands for Application Programming Interface. And program is right in the word. But uh, they are trying to just just like, you know, Apex is programming, but you can do it visually in flow. Salesforce is working on that here. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is that when a human navigated, for example, visually point and click navigated software application exists, Mm -hmm. but it also has a special alternate way of interacting with it that's meant just for fellow computers. Right. That special alternate way of interacting is the API. I think that's the best way to describe it. And since most software these days runs over the web, you access it in a web browser as a human. A lot of the, most of the APIs anybody talks about with cloud services these days, it runs over a protocol known as the Hypertext Transfer Protocol or HTTP, as you've seen at all the beginnings of your URLs. (laughs) All right. And that's starting to get like an alphabet soup 
Um, but it's there's actually not that much to know about it. It's kind of like Spanish. Once you learn how to say "Donde está el baño," and <laughs> you know that you're hungry, you've got ninety percent of what you need for a one week vacation. Right. And I think that learning just a little bit about what an HTTP request from a cl- from a client to a server looks like, mm-hmm. and the parts that will come back from a server to a client as a response. Um, that's that's maybe thirty minutes of study, mm-hmm. and I think it'll really give you a long get you a long way towards then being able to read the plain English documentation written about various APIs about how they work because the computers are almost always going over that protocol. It's not a very complicated protocol, and so then you can read the documentation. And I had to get that in, and I forgot what you actually <laughs> asked me, Josh. <laughs> okay, so no, no, that's that's a great. I, I always love level setting. That's a great one one Here's here's what an API is and, and describe. So at that point, where you have you know you have that access point for one computer to talk to each other, like what's the role in the schema for helping those two computers out? Yes. Okay. So schema schema basically means structure, how something is shaped, and so we are not necessarily talking about the schema of your data in either system as you, the human, perceive it. Mm-hmm. We are, in this case, talking about the schema, which is the particular... So you've got the HTTP protocol, which is a generic set of ways you... It, it, it's a much more generic idea. It's like the idea that you can have custom fields and custom objects. Mm-hmm. And then any given API will have its own rules. Like you might have set specific custom objects and specific custom fields in your org that nobody else has in their, their Salesforce org. And so when you get a new person, you have to train them what objects you created and why they're important to your business. Similarly, an API will have its own rules. Mm-hmm. And a schema is a way of writing down in kind of a code. You don't program with it, but it's a code the same way that like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, that like secret codes are a codes, you know? Yeah. Um, so often in a punctuation standard, a code called JSON or YAML, those are two different ones that are very similar, you will see a computer-friendly way of documenting exactly how this API works Mm -hmm. over the HTTP protocol. And that's what's known as a schema. It's basically the documentation about the API, but computer friendly. Right, right. And not to plug my own show too much, but we, by, but through the magic of podcast time travel, by the time this airs, uh, there will have been an episode by Tony Chiang talking about the open API specification that we are implementing at Salesforce. And a lot of that is about how, like, when you have a good schema that computers can just understand how much easier things get. So I will, I will point to that material. Um, that is perfect. So in that, okay, so we, so accessing the data and then to get to the data, we have to get through security. And I'm quoting you here, ask for permission, not forgiveness. What do you mean by that? It, I mean, there are definitely a lot of things in the world of what you do at work where it's almost easier to ask for forgiveness than permission and just get things done and please customers. In the case of security, when we are talking about APIs, we're usually, you know, we're almost certainly talking about integrating between Salesforce and something that is not Salesforce or that Mm -hmm. is some other Salesforce org. We're talking about taking candy from strangers. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And so this is, you probably have sensitive data in your Salesforce and you probably don't want to let hackers change the data in your Salesforce or get at it. Mm -hmm. And so you really... There are a lot of insecure ways to send data over the internet, and this is sending or receiving data over the internet. And so to me, I would say, absolutely, feel free to learn about HTTP, play with a dev org and a an API that just does something silly and doesn't require a password, and go nuts learning how to do it. But when you actually have a real idea, like, I want to use Twilio to text people. Yes. How do I do this right? If you have a uh, chief information security officer, talk to them and their team. If you mm-hmm. have other developers who've used APIs before, talk to them because they come sort of developers, especially web developers, come kind of batteries included with all these auxiliary skills, <laughs> like knowing about security over HTTP mm-hmm. and knowing about 
protecting passwords because there didn't used to be admin friendly tools for doing this kind of stuff. And right. so it's not that these are inherently programming skills. It's just that only programmers had to learn them because only programmers could do anything useful with them. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely before you do anything that actually talks between your Salesforce and your real third party service, get a lot of other people involved to make sh and, and make it a big project. Yeah. Because mistakes aren't going to be pretty. Mistakes are not going to be pretty, pretty. And I will put my data security hat back on for a moment and say just security is really everybody's job. Yeah. Like that's that's when security works best is when everybody is focused on it. Yeah. Okay. So I want to ping on that example that you were just talking about. You had a Cactus Force presentation with uh, Narendra Singh uh, about exactly that scenario. Can you tell me a little bit about what you two demoed at Cactus Force? Yes. So we, about a year ago, I demonstrated the idea of using Flow to engage in click-based API usage. And actually, I'm going to do another level set here, if you don't mind. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. In Salesforce, there are three different ways you hear the word API, mm -hmm. and they're not the same as each other, and it's really confusing. So you, number one, you have inbound built-in, number mm -hmm. two, inbound custom, and number three, outbound. And today we're talking about outbound. Okay. Inbound built-in is why you hear about field custom fields having an API name. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Every tool you've ever used that deals with Salesforce, Data Loader, MuleSoft, they're all using the inbound built-in APIs that Salesforce is using that, you know, to be a third party to someone else. Inbound custom is you can use Apex to poke extra holes in your castle if Salesforce's built-in ones aren't enough for you. Mm -hmm. And then outbound is where you can use Salesforce to go out and talk to other th third parties, computer service stores. So mm -hmm. we're talking about this third type, the outbound. So Salesforce has been investing in making Flow able to have declarative click-based ways to consume or use other people's APIs. And about a year ago, I demonstrated this with a screen flow that just displays random, silly animated GIFs. Nice. But Narendra has actually been doing real work with this and going deep. <laughs> um, so he's done text messaging with Twilio, scanned document optical character recognition with Google, and a whole lot more. And so I asked him if he would, if he wanted to co-present, and we showed off his text messaging solution nice. at Cactus Force, and we walked through how you put all the parts together, what the basic structure is of external services with Flow. Nice. Nice. And you have the, the resources for the sort of behind the scenes on that up on your website, correct? Yes. Yes. KatieCodes.com. Codes is spelled with a K slash Cactus Force 21. I want to ask you a little bit about KatieCodes.com. And, and I'm going to ask you a question you have actually on that site. Katie, why are you writing a blog about three plus programming languages in two human languages? The three plus programming languages is because I am an easily distracted jack of all trades. <laughs> and, and, and I love that. I'm proud of it. Mm -hmm. The two programming languages is I was at Dreamforce one year and I made a friend from France who said, you'll have to forgive my English. I really only can do presentations in good English. I don't have a lot of social English. Oh, said, interesting. That, I said, that's amazing. I could never give an all-day seminar in French, even though I've been right. speaking it for so many years. And yeah. so I, when I first started the blog, I had a, a goal that I have failed at to try to get every post in both languages as a way of practicing my business French. Nice. Nice. Um, I can deeply appreciate that. Like, as, as a Midwesterner who even at times has trouble hearing dialogues, much less speaking dialects and i have what i lovingly call a, a a a handle on beer spanish like going back to your example i can i can go to a restaurant i can order food i can order a beer i can find the, the restroom i can pay my tab and i can get home and that's about it <laughs> and so anytime i'm like at in a foreign country or anything like that somebody like they're like i am sorry for my english i'm like please do not apologize you are already far more capable of, of walking around this world and talking to other people um, than I am. So, so, so kudos on that. I did notice that 
you had a section talk, and I'm just because I use Python extensively for web work and scripting and things like that. And this this example just you're using Python as a replacement for Excel. Can you walk me through that? Sure. I've found that oftentimes you end up doing a little bit of a manual extract transform load process as an admin mm-hmm. for complicated things. You just download something through data loader, you crunch it, crunch it, crunch it in Excel, and then you push it right back into Salesforce. Mm-hmm. And particularly coming from the world of more traditional databases where it just would have been one massive insert where statement mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and Having not yet completely understood Apex at the time that I started this, I found that using Python against Excel was the closest I could get to that sort of, I have a massive amount of data crunching to do, Hmm. possibly 10 times in a row as the data updates. And people Mm -hmm. say, wait, never mind, I have an updated spreadsheet. And so the idea of scripting something and having a run button Hmm. was really appealing so and and also it's I found that Python's pandas module is far more rich than VLOOKUP in Excel for comparing one spreadsheet oh. to another. Okay. And so yeah, it's it's been a little bit of a way of pretending that my spreadsheets are inside of a database. <laughs> making them just a little bit smarter. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people do that by importing spreadsheets into Microsoft Access, but Mm -hmm. I found that the overhead is just a little bit smaller. Gotcha. Python. And that's our show. Now, before we go, I did ask after Katie's favorite non-technical hobby. It turns out it's something to do when she travels. Farmer's markets. Farmer's markets. Really? I don't run a stand, but I have a habit of going to them. In fact, I have actually never been to a celebrity based keynote and I've been to Dreamforce four times because <laughs> I've always been at some San Francisco farmer's market instead because I, I really make the most use of my time during the sessions. I am at every session, mm-hmm. but then I'm like, oh, great, there's a celebrity. I can go to a farmer's market. <laughs> and so I, ha- I have my very expensive compost habit is what I call it because even though I love to cook, I don't always actually cook at all, but I love the farmer's market. I want to thank Katie for the great conversation and information. And as always, I want to thank you for listening. I also want to offer a really quick apology because we plugged the weekly charity Fortnite stream that I play with some coworkers and community members a few weeks ago. But I think through the power of podcasting time travel, unfortunately, I think the first time people heard about it was a week that we had to cancel the stream, unfortunately. I swear we do almost always play Thursdays, 5 o'clock Central Time. If you want more information about that, follow me on Twitter at Josh Burke or over on Twitch, also at Josh Burke. Thanks again. If you want to learn more about this show, head on over to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast, where you can hear old episodes, see the show notes, and have links to your favorite podcast service. I'll talk to you next week. 